Buddy, thank you for joining me as I continue my examination of Timothy Keller's The Reason for God from My Atheist Perspective. In this video, I'm going to cover chapters 4 and 5. And let's go ahead and get started with chapter 4, which is titled, The Church is Responsible for So Much Injustice. Keller begins by telling the story of Mark Lilla, a University of Chicago professor who once wrote of how he left Christianity after having a born-again experience as a teenager. Lilla had been put off by the rigid dogmatism of the church he had fallen in with, watching how these Christians wielded the Bible as an instrument to control others led Lilla to question the truth of Holy Scripture for the first time. And Keller writes that many critics of Christianity, despite how outwardly intellectual their objections may be, have a history of personal disappointment with the faith and with the faithful, and that these disappointing experiences had something to do with shaping their negative attitudes toward Christianity. And Keller says, quote, If you have known many wise, loving, kind, and insightful Christians over the years, and if you have seen churches that are devout in belief, yet civic-minded and generous, you will find the intellectual case for Christianity much more plausible. Well, that all depends on how serious you are, I suppose, about your intellectual objections, doesn't it? I'm not saying that emotions and personal experience don't play a role. I think they play a very important role. We aren't robots. We have emotions, we have feelings, and we are guided by those feelings for good and for bad, unavoidably. But if you reject Christianity on truly logical, factual, intellectual grounds, I don't see how knowing a good number of kind-hearted, community-minded Christians is going to make that big of a difference. Nor do I see why it should, any reason why it should. Why should the fact that you know lots of wonderful people who are Christians affect your intellectual objections to their faith, to their religious beliefs, uh, at all. I have personally been fortunate enough to have known many such Christians, Christians who were kind, generous, intelligent, moral, generally just wonderful people, and I would never want to diminish the value of any of those qualities in them, but I still think that their religious beliefs are ridiculous. Quote, Mark Lilla's determination that the Bible might be wrong was not a pure act of philosophical reflection. He was resisting the way that a particular person in the name of Christianity was trying to exercise power over him. Stop being such assholes, guys. You're scaring off the marks. <laughs> My little paraphrase. Uh, Lilla's first suspicion that the Bible might not be what his then fellow Christians said it was, may have been triggered by an emotional response to how some of those Christians were behaving. But that doesn't mean Lilla's objections to Christianity never progressed beyond that point. Perhaps the problem, as Keller sees it, of Christians developing serious objections to their faith isn't due to dogmatic churches or misbehaving members, but to the fact that the faith itself is so difficult to justify through reason and evidence. If you meet uh, a, a scientist who is an asshole, does that automatically mean you begin to doubt modern cosmology or modern biology? Keller constantly tries in this book to draw parallels between science and the faith that a scientist might have in, in scientific knowledge and religious faith and the beliefs religious people have in, in their holy books and their and their religious beliefs. But if you meet a scientist who's an asshole, does that mean that you doubt cosmology, that you, you doubt the Big Bang, you doubt evolution? If you're an intelligent person, I think the answer is no, because these theories, these ideas are backed by facts and evidence and solid logic and good reasoning, and they're established in such a way that they don't rely on the personalities of the people who are teaching them. Keller identifies three areas where the behavior of Christians has undermined the plausibility of Christianity. Character flaws, war and violence, and fanaticism. So let's take the first one, character flaws. If Christianity is true, and its teachings lead to positive outcomes, 
Why do so many Christians seem to come up short in terms of their own character and their own behavior? Why are there so many non-religious people, it seems, who are living more morally upstanding and fulfilling lives than the Christians? And these are all uh, things that Keller asks, and I think they are all excellent questions. The problem here, Keller says, is another misunderstanding of Christianity. A lot of people have Christianity wrong. A lot of Christians have Christianity wrong, according to Timothy Keller. Uh, not that he's necessarily wrong about that, I'm just saying. Uh, the Bible teaches that every act of kindness or justice is ultimately from God. Whether that act is performed by a Christian consciously for the glory of God or not, God imparts gifts through his grace to everyone. So, if you're an atheist and you hold the door open for someone, guess what? You just proved that there is a God after all. Deal with that, atheist! In addition to God's indiscriminately distributed grace, Christianity also teaches that humans are morally inferior beings and that we can only attain salvation by calling on God. Keller quotes uh, an old saying, the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. Finally, Keller accounts for the perceived poorer character of many Christians by observing that many people turn to God after enduring difficult circumstances, since uh, such people are more likely to recognize a need for God in their lives. In discussing character flaws, Keller seems to be focusing on people who are undeniably troubled, Christians who struggle with anger issues or who have struggles with addiction or who have backgrounds that include some form of abuse or violence, things like this. But those aren't the sorts of things that I would bring up as an atheist, as a critic of Christianity, if I were asked to name some common Christian traits that I find off-putting. And judging by Keller's description, they aren't the sort of character flaws that compelled Mark Lilla to re-examine his faith either. What about Christians who willfully misrepresent scientific facts? What about Christians who taunt and shame women who have abortions, or even contemplate having an abortion? What about Christians who would deny same-sex couples the right to marry or adopt children? What about the victim playing? in which many American evangelicals indulge at the mildest provocation, the persecution complexes, the self-centered insistence that their interests always be considered before those of other groups, the attempt to deform the law into an instrument by which they can impose the standards of their church on those outside of it. See, I think those are much more typical of what we, the non-believers, find unappealing about the character of many Christians than the sorts of things Keller was talking about. I understand that people have issues. I understand that people are troubled. I understand that some people are just assholes. I don't count that against Christianity. There are certain uniquely, typically Christian behaviors of certain types of Christians, of conservative, of evangelical, particularly American Christians, that I find objectionable, that I find to be flaws of character, both character of the individual believers and character of that church in general. Those are the sorts of things I object to, not, not the sorts of everyday, common, shared, almost universal human foibles and results of, of tragedy and, and chaos in our lives that we all have to deal with. That doesn't count against Christianity, and I dare say a lot of atheists feel the same way and don't count Christians having imperfect personal lives against Christianity. Next, Keller turns from character flaws to the topic of religion and violence. He asks, is Christopher Hitchens right when he writes in God is Not Great that religion is a multiplier of tribalism and hatred? Well, Keller says that he is. He says Hitchens is right about that. Keller admits that religion elevates cultural differences to the level of cosmic struggles uh, and that Christian nations in particular have tolerated and even institutionalized violence and oppression. Uh, he also cites the totalitarian governments that ruled for a time in parts of the world influenced by Shintoism, Hinduism, and Islam. Keller counters this view by arguing that the regimes of the Soviet Union, 
communist China and Cambodia, among others, that originated in the 20th century, rejected organized religion and were actually following in a tradition that began with the French Revolution, which Keller points out was a secular, nominally rational movement. And he says, quote, Violence done in the name of Christianity is a terrible reality and must be addressed and redressed. There is no excusing it. In the 20th century, however, violence has been inspired as much by secularism as by moral absolutism. Societies that have rid themselves of all religion have been just as oppressive as those steeped in it. And Keller concludes, that things like war and oppression are ultimately due to violent impulses rooted deeply in all of us, no matter what our worldview is. And uh, <clears throat> I agree with him on that. I also think that if we could somehow uh, magically rid ourselves of all religious superstitions tomorrow, we would find other shit to fight about before too much time had passed. But that doesn't get religion off the hook. And Keller realizes this, I think, which is why the best he can do is to suggest that religious societies aren't any worse than secular societies in this regard. But that argument would have a bit more oomph to it if these supposedly secular regimes he cited as examples were not actually theocracies in disguise. I mentioned previously in this series that while Stalin and Hitler, to name the two most infamous examples, may have taken steps to oppress and undermine and co-opt traditional religions, they replaced them with religions of their own making, complete with strictly controlled, idealized history and self-consciously heroic imagery that encouraged worship of the leader and obedience to the state. And just because you can label a particular regime as secular, even if you do wish to do that with Stalinism, with Nazism, it doesn't mean that the crimes they committed were caused by secularism. Uh, quote, Ultimately, then, the fact of violence and warfare in a society is no necessary refutation of the prevailing beliefs of that society. Well, it may not be a factual refutation of those beliefs, since a belief can encourage negative, destructive outcomes and still nonetheless be true. But if the violence and warfare of a particular society can be shown to be tied to those prevailing beliefs, then doesn't that at least suggest that those beliefs are bad? That they aren't helpful? I think that was Hitchens' point in that chapter of God is Not Great. Not that the historically violent and warlike character of Christian societies showed Christian beliefs to be false. There are lots of other reasons to think that. But that religion in general has not been a positive influence on our species. It exacerbates and amplifies the negative aspects of our character that, that Keller was talking about. The violent impulses, the, 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 the tribalism, the, the impulse to separate ourselves from each other and to cut ourselves up into in-groups and out-groups and people in the out-groups are bad and people in the in-groups are good. Religion amplifies those tendencies. When you condition millions of people across multiple generations to unquestioningly accept false or unsupportable claims, it can sometimes bring about breathtakingly horrible results. Go figure. Finally, fanaticism. Keller calls this perhaps the biggest deterrent to Christianity for the average person today. He describes how many non-Christians are given a negative picture of the faith by the intolerance and the self-righteousness exhibited by evangelicals. And Keller describes a spectrum of Christianity with nominal Christians at one end and fanatical Christians at the other end, and then argues that this view of Christianity itself is part of the problem. The fact that we see it on a spectrum is part of the problem since it encourages those who are the most fervently devoted to the faith to look down on those less religious. Keller suggests that the solution to fanaticism is to come to understand Christianity not in terms of a spectrum of belief, but in terms of salvation through Christ. Salvation not because of what we do, but because of what Christ has done 
for us, he says. This belief in salvation that has not been earned, but given by God's grace, Keller says, is humbling. And he says, quote, The people who are fanatics, then, are, are so not because they are too committed to the gospel, but because they're not committed to it enough. It's not because they are too Christian, but because they are not Christian enough. Note that Keller's idea to address the problem of fanatical Christians is for them to practice his version of Christianity. And this seems to be his preferred solution to all of Christianity's problems, but it's especially silly here. On the previous page, he criticized viewing Christianity as a spectrum, because those who think they've got it right will eventually begin to feel negatively about those who they think have got it wrong. But what's Keller doing here? telling fanatical Christians that they've got it wrong. They aren't Christian enough, and that he's got it right. Committing further to his fanatics just aren't Christian enough argument, Keller writes of how a fuller understanding of the Bible should discourage the type of behavior and attitudes we associate with religious fanaticism. In the Gospels, Keller says, Jesus criticizes religious fanaticism, and religious elitism, condemns legalism and self-righteousness, and is eventually condemned to death by the religious establishment. Additionally, Jesus' criticism of religious intolerance belongs to a pattern of such thought that uh, reaches back through the Bible into the Old Testament and to the prophet Isaiah, who called out those who practiced their religion conspicuously but continued to mistreat and neglect other people. It's to Keller's credit, I suppose, that these are the types of ideals he derives from the Bible. But isn't it possible to derive the more intolerant ideals of fanatics from that same Bible? After all, the same Jesus who preaches love and forgiveness and charity also behaves like an entitled egomaniac and demands total devotion from his closest followers, including the abandonment of their families and livelihoods. And the same God who inspired Isaiah to speak out against false piety and the abuse of the poor by the powerful also personally commits acts of horrifying genocide whenever it suits him, commands his chosen people to do the same, and imposes exactly the sort of intrusive totalitarian laws that Keller says modern zealots would be better off avoiding. His comparatively gentle community-minded Christianity is no more genuinely biblical than the harsher, stricter version practiced by the fanatics. The problem, Keller says, isn't with the practice of religion, but with the use of religion to gain power over others. The solution is to recognize and accept that salvation comes only through God's grace, not as a result of personal goodness or accomplishment. If we accept that it doesn't make any difference to God how religious we appear to others, we'll be less likely to think and behave like fanatics and more humble and selfless and concerned for others. Even though the church has been responsible for oppression and injustice throughout history, which again, Keller readily admits, the values critics use to attack it for these things actually come from Christianity itself. Keller says, quote, Many criticize the church for being power-hungry and self-regarding, but there are many cultures in which the drive for power and respect is considered a good. Where, then, did we get this list of virtues by which we can discern the church's sins? We actually got it from within the Christian faith. And Keller illustrates this with a thought experiment originally suggested by C. John Somerville. Quote, Imagine seeing a little old lady coming down the street at night carrying a big purse. Why not just knock her over and take the purse and its money? The answer of an honor-shame culture is that you do not take the purse because if you pick on the weak, you would be a despicable person. No one would respect you and you would not respect yourself. That ethic, of course, is self-regarding. You are focused on how the action will affect your honor and reputation. There is, however, another train of thought to take. You may imagine how much it would hurt to be mugged, and how the loss of money might harm people who depend on her. 
So you don't take the money because you want the best for her and for her dependents. This is an other regarding ethic. You are thinking completely about her. Well, that's also known as empathy. And I hate to break it to Keller, but it's not a quality that is unique or even particular to Christianity. In fact, if you look close enough, I think you'll even find it present within that first example of the self-centered ethic of the honor-shame culture. After all, why is it despicable to take advantage of the weak? The culture might emphasize the concept of personal honor and strength over empathy for others, but if that empathy weren't there, why would it be considered dishonorable to mistreat the weak? Anyway, Somerville would put this thought experiment to his students, and then he would explain how that other regarding ethic was Christian in nature, which he illustrated by the example of Christian missionaries transforming honor-shame cultures into cultures based around the ideas of humility and service. Would it be too cynical of me to suggest that uh, the church which sent those missionaries out in the first place had motives for making people submissive and humble that had more to do with growing the wealth and influence of the church than with improving the character of the converted? Of course it wouldn't. Quote, What is the answer, then, to the very fair and devastating criticisms of the record of the Christian church? The answer is not to abandon the Christian faith, because that would leave us with neither the standards nor the resources to make the correction. And this is one of the more insidious tactics Keller employs in the book, and it's very unbecoming of a guy who tries so hard to appear open and reasonable. The way he describes it, Christianity is something fundamental and necessary and inescapable. Even non-Christians are dependent on it, even when we're criticizing it. It's similar to how he tried to resolve the conflict between religion and skepticism by claiming that it was just all religion. Uh, but it's worse this time because he's not merely saying that the values to which we appeal to criticize fanaticism are dependent on religion. He's saying they're dependent specifically on his religion. We can't criticize Christianity without relying on Christian principles to do so. And my answer to this, uh, respectfully, is like fuck we can't. Humility, charity, kindness, and concern for others, they might be important virtues in the version of Christianity that Keller practices. And again, I think that's to his credit. Uh, and they might be of ostensible importance to Christianity in general. But that doesn't mean they originated with Christianity or that they are exclusively Christian traits. These traits and the empathy in which they are rooted are deeply rooted in our humanity. And to suggest that to abandon Christianity is also to abandon them is preposterous and insulting and betrays a level of conceit that I think Keller would wish to avoid if he truly values modesty, not to mention intellectual honesty, as much as he professes to. Keller spends the rest of the chapter describing two examples of Christian self-correction, when the church initiated major reforms by living up to its own ideals. The first of these is the abolition of slavery. Keller says, quote, Christians began to work for abolition not because of some general understanding of human rights, but because they saw it was violating the will of God. Older forms of indentured servanthood and the bond service of biblical times had often been harsh, but Christian abolitionists concluded that race-based, lifelong chattel slavery established through kidnapping could not be squared with the biblical teaching either in the Old Testament or the New. And so they took a stand against that particular narrowly defined form of slavery. Not because their humanity cried out in outrage, but because they realized it was probably against the rules. Very commendable. I can't argue with the result. The abolition of slavery is the abolition of slavery, regardless of its philosophical foundations. But I've always found it telling, maybe a little suggestive, that it took so many centuries for large enough numbers of Christians to realize this and decide slavery was an intolerable institution in order to accomplish abolition. 
and that they only came to this realization after the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. Keller's second example of a reform driven by commitment to truly Christian principles is the American Civil Rights Movement in the 20th century. He says, quote, White Northern liberals who were allies of the African American civil rights leaders were not proponents of civil disobedience or of a direct attack on segregation. Because of their secular belief in the goodness of human nature, they thought that education and enlightenment would bring about inevitable social and racial progress. When Martin Luther King Jr. confronted racism in the white church in the South, he did not call on Southern churches to become more secular. He invoked God's moral law and the scripture. And he also continued a tradition of civil disobedience that in the United States is traceable directly back to Henry David Thoreau and beyond that to Percy Shelley, whose work was a strong influence on Mohandas Gandhi, who in turn strongly influenced Martin Luther King Jr. Neither Thoreau, nor Shelley, nor Gandhi are notable for their devotion to Christianity, nor were their ideas dependent upon it. It would be unfair to argue that Christians deserve no credit for the abolition of, of African slavery or the reforms of the civil rights movement in the United States. Certainly, there were Christians who felt called by their faith to challenge oppression and discrimination and who played significant roles in establishing and accomplishing those reforms. In addition to King, Keller also mentions William Wilberforce. The problem is, Christians tend to want to take all the credit and to exaggerate the role the church played in these movements, especially early on, and to overlook the contributions of non-Christians like Thomas Paine, Robert Ingersoll, and in the case of slavery, most especially, William Lloyd Garrison, one of the most prominent abolitionists of the 19th century, uh, who was also a passionate supporter of women's rights. And they also tend to gloss over the many Christians who used their faith as justification for supporting slavery and racial discrimination. Though I suppose Keller would just hand wave this and chalk it up to those folks not being Christian enough. Now to chapter 5, which is titled, How Can a Loving God Send People to Hell? Keller opens this chapter with an account of a Pew Foundation forum from 2005, where megachurch pastor and author of The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren, was asked how he reconciles the, the contradiction of recognizing that non-Christians deserve the same rights and privileges in society as Christians, while simultaneously believing that those same people are going to hell when they die because they haven't been saved. Warren answered that he saw no contradiction, but some of the journalists attending the forum suggested that the doctrine of hell conditions Christians to perceive those outside their church as of lesser worth. Keller claims to understand the distress that the teaching that the unsaved go to hell causes to many, and he deconstructs the objection to hell, first examining the belief that it simply can't be true, that a God who sends people to hell can't possibly exist. He says, quote, Our culture, therefore, has no problem with a God of love who supports us no matter how we live. It does, however, object strongly to the idea of a God who punishes people for their sincerely held beliefs, even if they are mistaken. I agree, generally speaking, that we're far more welcoming of affirmation than we are of condemnation. Uh, of course, a loving and accepting God is more palatable to most of us than a judgmental one. But there's more to the objection to hell than that. It's not the concept of divine punishment that bothers a lot of us as much as it is the arbitrary and extraordinarily excessive nature of that punishment. And speaking for myself, I'm not as morally troubled by the fact that so many Christians believe that non-believers will go to hell when they die as I am by the fact that it doesn't seem to bother them very much. Keller says, quote, in ancient times, it was understood that there was a transcendent moral order outside the self, built into the fabric of the universe, 
Modernity reversed this. Ultimate reality was seen not so much as a supernatural order, but as the natural world, and that was malleable. Instead of trying to shape our desires to fit reality, we now seek to control and shape reality to fit our desires. What's the evidence that this transcendent universal moral order recognized by the ancients actually, you know, exists? And isn't it just possible that the shift away from that concept of morality by many is due in part to the lack of such evidence? Also, the natural world is not nearly so malleable as we in our selfishness might like it to be. Our ability to control our environment is limited, local, and extremely temporary. If modern science has revealed nothing else, it has revealed that the world is as it is, not as we would have it be. Finally, is a man who believes that an invisible, omnipotent God will grant him eternal life in a blissful paradise after he dies, a man whose solution to religious conflict is to recommend that everyone take up the practice of his religion, really trying to take the piss out of other people for trying to shape reality to fit their desires? Keller ties this rejection of the concept of a God of judgment to the modern desire to control our own lives. Keller again points out the inconsistency of objecting to a judging God but not to a forgiving God. He suggests that someone from another culture might have the opposite objection, that the God of judgment makes more sense, while the concept of forgiveness and turning the other cheek could be nonsensical or even offensive. And who is to say which culture's judgment is valid? Quote, For the sake of argument, let's imagine that Christianity is not the product of any one culture, but is actually the transcultural truth of God. If that were the case, we would expect that it would contradict and offend every human culture at some point, because human cultures are ever-changing and imperfect. If Christianity were the truth, it would have to be offending and correcting your thinking at some point. Maybe this is the place, the Christian doctrine of divine judgment. By the way, if Christianity were the transcultural truth of God, wouldn't we expect it to have been transmitted to people transculturally? rather than through one particular ancient culture? Just saying. Well, anyway, uh, maybe that's true. Maybe maybe uh, the doctrine of divine judgment is an area where my beliefs are being corrected and challenged. Or maybe it's Keller's interpretation of Christianity that needs to be corrected, and it's, say, uh, the universalists who believe that all sinners will ultimately be reconciled with God, who actually have it right. Or maybe it's the annihilationists who believe that ultimately all the people in hell will simply be wiped out of existence rather than forced to suffer forever who have it right. You never know. And that's the thing about doctrines based on unfalsifiable, invented bullshit. You just never know. Next, Keller addresses the objection that no god of judgment could also be a god of love. He says, quote, I always start my response by pointing out that all loving persons are sometimes filled with wrath, not just despite of, but because of their love. If you love a person and you see someone ruining them, even they themselves, you get angry. Well, sure, you get angry. Even though you yourself are ultimately responsible for their ruination, since the most severe consequences they face are the result of arbitrary and impossible to satisfy conditions you yourself established, and in your anger you see to it that this person you love is made to suffer horribly for their transgression forever, unless they ask for your forgiveness in just the right way, of course. I mean, we can all relate to that, can't we? I mean, who hasn't been there? Keller, citing theologian Miroslav Volf, argues that belief in a God who punishes evildoers discourages us from committing our own acts of violent retribution. He says, quote, Can our passion for justice be honored in a way that does not nurture our desire for blood vengeance? Volf says the best resource for this is belief in the concept of God's divine justice. If I don't believe that there is a God 
who will ultimately put all things right, I will take up the sword and will be sucked into the endless vortex of retaliation. Only if I am sure that there is a God who will right all wrongs and settle all accounts do I have the power to refrain. Well, thanks for sharing, Tim. It's nice to know that the only thing holding you back from waging a personal bloody war against all that you perceive to be unjust is your belief that eventually God is going to do it for you. Not trust in the laws of society, not a belief that being sucked into the endless vortex of retaliation, as you put it, would be self-destructive and ultimately futile. Not that you just wouldn't be capable of inflicting such violence on other people, no matter how deserved, but the belief that God is going to handle the wet work himself. It's a good thing we atheists have you Christians around to remind us of what true morality is all about. Next, Keller considers the objection that a, a loving God wouldn't allow hell. The Bible doesn't say merely that God fights injustice and punishes the wicked. It says that the unsaved are eternally punished. What are we going to do with that? Well, Keller writes that the concept of hell is better understood, another misunderstanding, in terms of separation from God. Our sin separates us from God. And if we die without reconciling with God through Christ, we must spend eternity in separation from God. And since God is ultimately necessary for us to experience things like love and joy, eternity apart from God is the worst hell imaginable. Keller says, quote, In short, hell is simply one's freely chosen identity apart from God on a trajectory into infinity. When we build our lives on anything but God, that thing, though a good thing, becomes an enslaving addiction, something we have to have to be happy. Personal disintegration happens on a broader scale. In eternity, this disintegration goes on forever. There is increasing isolation, denial, delusion, and self-absorption. When you lose all humility, you are out of touch with reality. No one ever asks to leave hell. The very idea of heaven seems to them a sham. Uh, he describes building our lives on things other than God and how they become enslaving addictions, something that we have to have to be happy. Isn't that exactly what he's saying God is? Isn't he saying we have to have God to be happy? Uh, does anyone ever ask to leave heaven? He says people never ask to leave hell. Does anyone ever ask to leave heaven? Because residence there doesn't strike me as being on a voluntary basis either. I mean, sure, people choose to accept Christ in order to get there, but that non-stop worship of God shit might start to get old after forever, you know. Is anybody ever allowed to leave? Never mention that. So Keller interprets the old concept of the fires of hell figuratively. Hell to him isn't a place of literal burning and torture, but a place where God is totally absent. And even if that's the case, how does that let God off the hook for the suffering of people in hell? Keller says that we suffer so greatly in hell because we were made to exist in the presence of God, which means that God, who is omniscient as well as omnipotent, created us knowingly to need his presence, knowing that before very long we would be separated from him by our sin and that the vast majority of us would wind up suffering forever without him. Now, whether you believe in literal hellfire or just the burning torments of endless hopelessness and isolation, either way, God is responsible for the suffering of the people there in hell because he created the people and he knowingly created the circumstances that all but guaranteed that almost all of them would suffer greatly and endlessly. As I said earlier, the truly offensive thing about the doctrine of hell, for many of us, isn't merely the concept of a divine punishment. It's how arbitrary and unjust and extreme the punishment is in the teachings of the Christian Church. Eternal punishment for ephemeral transgressions, people damned 
to everlasting suffering for failing within a system that made it essentially impossible to succeed. Keller argues that the belief in eternal punishment of the unsaved doesn't make Christians narrow-minded compared to those who don't believe in hell. It merely makes them aware of the fact that wrongdoing has infinite consequences. He says, quote, Imagine two people arguing over the nature of a cookie. Jack thinks the cookie is poison, and Jill thinks it is not. Jack thinks Jill's mistaken view of the cookie will send her to the hospital or worse. Jill thinks Jack's mistaken view of the cookie will keep him from having a fine dessert. Is Jack more narrow-minded than Jill just because he thinks the consequences of her mistakes are more dire? Are we at all interested in whether or not the cookie is actually poisoned? And if it is, should we not be the least bit troubled by the fact that the guy who baked the poison cookies forces us all to eat them and then only gives the poison antidote to those who find him and specifically ask him for it, even though he has enough for everyone? Keller ends the chapter by criticizing the belief of non-Christians in a God of love, since without the Bible to tell us that God is love, we would never reach that conclusion from the state of the world today or from history. Keller reminds us that the Bible, the same Bible that teaches a God of love, also teaches that God is a God of judgment. You can't have one without the other. Well, hey, there's another thing that Keller and I agree on. The only sources for the notion that God is a God of love, or a God of judgment, or a God of anything, are the claims of religions. There is no empirical evidence demonstrating the existence, much less the nature and character of any God that anyone has ever believed in. The only reason, apart from his own imagination, for a Christian to believe his God exists, and is a God of judgment or a God of love or both at once, is the Bible. And there is no reason why any of us should take the Bible seriously as a source of authoritative information about anything least of all God. And given the almost inconceivably cruel and capricious character of the God of the Bible, I, for one, am glad that that's the case. Well, that's it for that chapter. That's it for this video. I will be back in the next video in this series to cover chapter 6, Science Has Disproved Christianity. That sounds like a good one. Uh, and chapter 7, you can't take the Bible literally, and I will also be covering the intermission section of the book that's between the first part and the second part. So that's the next video, chapter 6, chapter 7, and the intermission. I will see you guys then. Uh, please feel free to comment on anything I've said. Leave a comment on this video with your thoughts, with your replies, your responses, your agreements, disagreements, whether you be atheist or Christian or any one of the myriad other possible worldviews, religious, non-religious, whatever. I'm so interested to hear what you have to say. I love to read your responses and to take part in conversations with you. I've had some really interesting, enlightening, clarifying exchanges in the comments on these videos, and I, I hope that that continues. Thank you guys so, so much for watching and, and finding some use in this, and I will see you next time.